So UCB is a global biopharma leader, so we aim to really improve uh, the life of a patient uh, with severe disease. We decided to focus on uh, specific therapeutic areas that are uh, bone, uh, immunology, neurology. Uh, we will develop uh, solutions, so not only uh, really the drug, but the whole uh, piece to help a uh, patient live better, uh, really in these uh, specific therapeutic areas. We are present in more than 30 countries. Mm -hmm. uh, you can imagine by developing these solutions, we have the wide array of skills and expertise at UCB, from the research and development uh, science uh, experts throughout the uh, you know, uh, development, clinical, preclinical, um, and then um, what what is re related to the commercialization, supply chain, um, etc. So, on top of our support function, of of course, that are uh, much more related to the finance piece, talent, HR organization, or um, really the legal, uh, of course, uh, departments. So we have quite a diverse. Uh, workforce uh, at UCB and, and, and we want to acquire every day the best talent wherever they come from so we're also quite international uh, I would say and I'm proud to be part of this international uh, company uh, based here uh, in Belgium. We have uh, to give you a number today uh, 140-ish uh, position open from a permanent perspective we have continuously also opportunities from a contingency perspective that are fluctuating depending on the needs. Um, overall that is quite uh, dynamic also in, in that part, so we're a 7,500 people company for the UCB employees only mm -hmm. perspective, so um, I would say that's quite a diverse environment, diverse in terms of skills, nationalities, countries covered, uh, for uh, such a company with only 7,500 people, basically. Uh, everything we do at UCB starts with the question of how can we um, improve the life of people uh, living with um, severe diseases. And uh, our whole operating model is built around that. Um, and that basically means that um, the skills and the competencies that we need um, are in many cases very specific, in some cases very short notice, but um, but in the end it's a, it's a people business. So I think that um, to answer your question that it's really our challenge to find the right talent um, at the right at the right time. Before we went to the market and uh, chose and implemented an MSP uh, program, we had an internal resource um, in purchasing in Belgium, as well as some part-time resources across different different um, different countries that were supporting the needs uh, of those contingent workers. Basically, those people were were managing agencies, writing SOWs, and making sure that the contractual piece was there. However, what that model was lacking was was a scalability as well as uh, some broader insight into how is your contingent workforce uh, population evolving, uh, as well as also the ability to actually source in multiple countries at the same time. So that is actually the reason why we um, we chose to um, formalize the identification, the sourcing, and the management of contingent workers through an MSP program. And in the last three years, we, uh, we implemented it in uh, three different countries, but we also had to account for the specific needs of certain of our business units, like, for example, our uh, uh, IT colleagues um, and our, uh, our colleagues in, um, in uh, research and, and uh, development were already highly leveraged from a contingent workforce perspective. So we had to make sure that when we implemented the MSP, that we catered for their needs. I think when you start an MSP program, 
the immediate benefit you would get is that you create a, a marketplace and that marketplace becomes then easier to manage because you have the requests coming in through a structured process you have your suppliers being onboarded uh, in a very intelligent way and you have the msp team that actually brings another service uh, to both the suppliers as your internal stakeholders so i think it was a natural extension of what we would try to do as purchasing being um, a value contributor rather than a cost cutter um, so the first visibility the first, the first benefits of the msp is really that you you create more transparency in how your contingent workers are, are coming into the organization and which agencies are working for ucb and after a while then it, it becomes interesting because then you can start let's say playing and tweaking that that, that marketplace you can Im implement rate cards you can implement uh, supplier performance uh, metrics which then drive uh, the underperformers out and the mm -hmm. and the uh, and the good performers um, get uh, better high. better benefits, more access, etc. So I think that is the that is the immediate gain you get for, from uh, impl implementing an MSP. So the MSP has been very good at sourcing commodity skills, but in many cases. Um, we have not been able to support managers that have very specific needs. Mm -hmm. For example, if you if you want to um, if you want to find a network of nurses that can help patients with their first uh, uh, self-administered drug, um, then then you probably need something else than just a contingent worker. Or if you um, if you want to engage with a project manager with very specific skills. You might not necessarily want to fish in the pool of your existing suppliers. You might just have that one individual uh, that is kind of like a white knight uh, and that is not on the radar screen of any of those agencies that you work with. So it's about finding the balance between managing your uh, rate cards, supplier performance metrics and driving the complexity of your, of your um, MSP model down. And on the other hand, specifically for UCB, I would say then, um, those and higher level skills, how, you, how can you also make sure that you, you as an MSP model, mm -hmm. you, you, you support the managers that have, that have those needs. Once we understood that uh, there is not only need for uh, commodity skills, but also for more niche skills, actually the MSP model um, became a bit challenged. Because actually, your MSP relies on that ability to source, that ability to benchmark, mm -hmm. that ability to effectively work across suppliers. So the challenge was there that managers who wanted those new skills, they actually didn't really see the value of the MSP uh, model. Mm -hmm. um, hence, we continued to see uh, unexplored areas of our business where actually there is a reluctancy to work with the MSP model. Um, and even if, if, if people are happy to be, uh, to be compliant with the MSP process, then still they don't, they don't always see, see the value or then they don't always um, believe that, uh, that it's fair to be charged uh, an internal cost for uh, placing that contingent work. I think working with our partner helped us coordinate much more um, first the experience we want to have for our, our candidates and manager uh, throughout the company that was far less uh, developed that way or shared a few years ago when we didn't have it. Secondly, uh, that increased the visibility and understanding of our recruitment flows, let's say, throughout the years to understand uh, also how uh, where we still had, um, let's say, difficulty sometimes to find the right skills that ask, is asking ourselves a question, are we looking into the right pool of candidates uh, and, and where we have uh, an easier way to, to attract people. So definitely that helped us from a, a data perspective to get more insight about mm -hmm. how the dynamic work with recruitment, while actually our company has been evolving quite a lot let's say that's another lesson learned that uh, we don't have a static kind of uh, organization or missions uh, through to, pa to the patients it's, it's, it's evolving also it, it has evolved to, to really uh, work and focus 
on severe disease and helping people with these conditions. So we definitely um, adapted also a business, for example, uh, developing a team uh, to, to work on, on um, medical devices linked to our solutions. So there you need to acquire the right skills and you need to have an RPO or a solution to recruit these people, adapting constantly in acquiring these new competencies. On the MSP side, we have had challenges in going global. Um, we are servicing now four countries, but the smaller countries, as well as some, um, uh, I would say, more uh, developing countries, are more difficult to land with the MSP model, which is basically a European slash an US bred solution. So first of all, being able to benefit from the the global presence of the RPO solution was for us a great, I would say, a jumping board. Um, secondly, um, something that we have seen in our teams as well as customers uh, is that in many cases um, people that join UCB first as a contractor or a project manager afterwards become interested and might uh, pursue uh, an employee position at mm -hmm. UCB and um, actually we've seen that the programs then don't always work work together very very in a well coordinated way let's put it as such so I think there as well um, and again linking it back then to uh, the point I made before about how can you make sure that you engage with the worker in the right way so that you're you have the best chance to achieve the impact that you achieve. I think that that for us was also important to make sure, okay, how can we make sure by, by first bringing visibility into, into the workforce and then also being able to make sure that people can transition between uh, different worker profiles as well as that when we look for talent that we, we are also able to look at not just the pool of candidates or suppliers that we might have been using in the past, but that we take that, that holistic view of UCB. We, we uh, would like to, to implement that from a um, you know, sequence approach. Mm -hmm. So we'll first, as we mentioned, we will first um, capitalize on the countries where we have uh, already the RPO solution in place. Mm -hmm. And, and, and make sure we first target these groups and where we have the MSP in place. And, and we'll go for a second wave in 2018, uh, as this is the plan, to, to further expand then the, the coverage and that uh, one kind of one-stop shop solution for our business. Okay. Uh, yes, and to build on that, Geraldine, I think the The first thing we realized is that the first experience is not about the technology and the ability to source, but the first experience is the first conversation, mm. is around you need a talent, um, and then through a, f a few targeted questions, define what, what probably the best, quickest, most efficient route to getting the talent started is. So. We actually believe that for our managers, which ultimately are our customers as well, it's important to put someone in front of them that can ask that question. And that is not a technology mm -hmm. or a model or a contextual set perspective. It is just uh, building a model where that person is there or is approachable. So by in the, in the first wave of our implementation, making sure that those former recruiters are now talent advisors. We believe that we, we will continue to build that momentum where we are talking about talent in a, in a, in a more, um, let's say, contract agnostic way. How, how we want to make sure that, that this integrated talent acquisition model works, it is by having a strong and broad 
it, it is by having a strong and broad governance. Mm -hmm. And I think this is the, one of the key success factors of the fact that we are here uh, today and in full implementation mode towards this integrated talent acquisition model at UCB. Three years ago when we implemented the MSP, it was a purchasing only choice to Im implement the MSP. Five years ago when uh, the, um, the HR team implemented uh, the first RPO, it was largely only their decision. So other um, stakeholders around were less involved, like for example IT, finance, uh, or even legal, and in some cases even, uh, mm -hmm. let's say, talent not involved in purchasing or purchasing not involved in talent. So if you look at our governance team now, it is really uh, built on five pillars. You have talent, you have purchasing, you have finance, you have IT and legal, and we have people from a senior management position taking part in that uh, governance model. So I think that's where the foundations of uh, building ITA and keeping ITA alive and bringing more impact to the organizations lie. So it basically means that um, we will have to redefine where some of the boundaries are mm -hmm. between what is talent's responsibility uh, and what is the remit of purchasing. What you sometimes see is that um, people try to get a solution for their needs, but they use a contextual form that they know, but which might not be best suited to get the objective achieved. So for example, the worst example would be that you have an IT application that is maintained by a contractor, because then when the application is down, you want it to be up as quickly as possible, but the contractual relationship is one where you pay by the hour. So the longer the repair takes, the more you're gonna you're gonna pay for it. So I think the challenge from uh, from us as a purchasing team, or the, the mission that we have, is to make sure that we have the right type of contract for the right business objective. And that's where we that's where we discovered that actually there is a joint joint mission. Um, what is the business objective you want to achieve? What is the impact you want to to create? And then the second question is, how can you best, because in the end we're a people business, like most businesses are, but how can you best engage with people to get that, bus that business objective or that impact created? So we do have, and we take that accountability cross-functional team to own this, uh, primarily, I guess, Weeds and I, and, and we, we have a clear ownership to make sure that the solution that we would put forward is uh, globally consistent and locally relevant also that's how we work also with with and we've embarked also colleagues from the different regions you have to understand also that our uh, organization is very networked we want to engage more and more also the people in these countries having different realities into um, this type of project to make sure again this is relevant mm -hmm. uh, knowing for the contingency part and that's also my learning piece here in this project is that it's very highly complex and very different in the different countries and geographies so yes we have the accountability responsibility but we do share that also with our colleagues so to make sure that we have a relevant uh, solution that is really achieving the goal the mission we have So I think I think the I think the main realization that we came to through the vendor selection process was that um, we want to ensure the solution is region agnostic, meaning that in the staffing industry all companies are regionally organized, and the provider that ultimately we is selected, Randstad Sourceright, came with a very compelling argument about having a global PNL. Whilst for us it's not about the PNL, because you can always let's say transfer costs and do internal bookings and all of that, we as an organization we are also um, 
we were particularly appealed by that argument because we don't have a, a global regional national structure we are rather a global national so we don't really talk about regions we talk about countries the us for example is a very important country brazil is a very important growth market japan and china are not apec they are japan and china so i believe that some of the other contenders in the selection process were really struggling with that mm -hmm. and also in the decision making process actually it's um it's a known challenge in the staffing industry that many of those companies have grown through acquisitions and there are still regional decision processes. So that's on the, on the first part on why we chose uh, another vendor. Um, I think also on the, on, the, on the part of where we are today is that we have, um, we've not been able to get the same consistent process and, and consistent quality in the different regions, if you mm -hmm. can call it like that. So um, we, um, we realized going through the selection process that uh, building on the foundations of the past would not, would not be ambitious enough versus the challenge that we are putting ourselves uh, forward. No, let's say that um, from a um, recruitment uh, permanent recruitment perspective that stays in, we keep the same technology that we've been growing through UCB, uh, success factors. This has been uh, implemented since uh, 2013 with a whole different aspect of the talent management. And now we're completing a major project in, in connecting all that with our employee central uh, master data now uh, in, in October. Uh, so that's really in the same line in that kind of uh, experience-oriented approach for our users. That's how we selected success factors at first. So we continue in the same, I would say, roadmap from a tooling perspective, and we're gonna use uh, success factors recruitment, onboarding, and employee central to help uh, the uh, mission here with integrated talent acquisition. From a contingency part, that can also be connected to the choice of field class, um, and that's, it, Ideally, what we aim to do is to have an overview, a greater visibility of our own talent pool, like we commented earlier. So we also looked at tools that would enable us to do that ideally in the future much more, knowing that today we don't have a tool that covers the contingency and permanent recruitment mm -hmm. part in one. And if I can build on that, I, I believe what I would like to see in the future is that as a company we can change our decision making process around how we deploy resources uh, because historically speaking you will have your uh, hr or talent teams talking about uh, the so-called headcount and you will have your purchasing or procurement teams talk about opex or uh, uh, budgets or, or, or whatever we believe that by bringing more visibility into how managers are using workers that we can start challenging that that way of looking at your teams so in the future i would like ucb to be able to say that manager achieves that results with so many workers rather than having at one point of the year a view of the budget and another point of the year a view of the headcount, which which is kind of like this archaic model of differentiating between employees and flexible workers. Um, so that's that's the internal perspective. So ideally, is to also focus on their experience, having that point of contact, um, if some people are open to maybe more permanent job or have actually their limited company to also work if they would like to and on, on, on specific mission and, and project, that could be done through the same contact person, same way as for the hiring manager internally at UCB. So that's how we can improve uh, the experience in the future uh, why not having all these opportunities gathered in one place for a candidate so to access them and to understand what are the, the actual limited duration mission, 
the, the, the long-term permanent roles uh, rather than having that separated. But I'd say that's going to be for the future and further development because we're not talking only uh, about the ego life, uh, but only the start of a, of a program, of an evolving program over the years. I believe the workforce in general is becoming more, fle more flexible. There are people who before were looking for jobs are now looking for projects. And if we don't acknowledge that, and if we only fish in one of, of the two pools, we are, restra we, are, we are restraining ourselves from the options and the potential size of that candidate pool. So it is that external change in the workforce that if we keep on using our old ways of finding talent with say differentiated models and, and a suboptimal sourcing approach, we are reducing our own chances to get the right person in and to get him in, him or her, um, uh, with the right skill set at the right time, uh, at a reasonable cost and, 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 and creating the maximum impact. So I think it's also that realization that uh, the whole um, I will be hired until I retire uh, model is, is, is out of the window. And it's by acknowledging that, that the rest of the story kind of becomes obvious. Um, but if I may add on that, to your point about the experience of candidate, we've been working quite separately in approaching candidates in the past or so far. So the idea with integrated talent acquisition is that we also uh, enable our talent advisors to check whether it's for contingency roles or permanent, the cultural fit of the people and we can also have a dialogue with them about what it is to work at UCB, whether you come as a contractor or permanent. Whereas today we, we have much more of these discussions for permanent roles.